Good evening, ladies and gentlemen. And guten Abend, um, Bill. Where are you? There you are, partner. This evening, our scripture is taken from the book of the Revelation of St. John. I'll be reading chapter 4. After these things I looked, and behold, a door standing open in heaven. And the first voice which I heard was like a trumpet speaking with me, saying, Come up here, and I will show you things which must take place after this. And immediately I was in the Spirit. And behold, a throne set in heaven. And one sat there on the throne. And he who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance. And there was a rainbow around the throne in appearance like an emerald. And around the throne were twenty-four thrones, and on the thrones I saw twenty-four elders sitting, clothed in white robes, and they had crowns of gold on their heads. And from the throne proceeded lightnings, thunderings, and voices. Seven lamps of fire were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. And in the midst of the throne and around the throne were four living creatures, full of eyes in front and in back, and the first living creature was like a lion, the second living creature like a calf, the third had a face like a man, and the fourth living creature was like a flying eagle. And the four living creatures, each having six wings, were full of eyes around and within, and they do not rest day or night, saying, Holy, 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 Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the twenty-four elders fall down before him who sits on the throne and worship him who lives forever and ever. And they cast their crowns before the throne saying, You are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. the Word of God for the people of God. Let us pray. O oh God, when we contemplate even for a moment the transcendent majesty of Your glory, the beauty of Your holiness. We are stricken 
We are pierced in our souls, and we are made to tremble before you. We know, our Father, there is no higher theme known to the human imagination than that which we seek to contemplate and examine in the hours to come. And we simply are not able to bear these things save by Thy Spirit. And so we plead with You tonight to visit us supernaturally as we seek to peer into sacred things. For we ask it in the name of Christ. Amen. From the moment the Lord God banished Adam and Eve from the Garden of Eden, requiring them to live east of Eden. And from the moment he placed the angel with the flaming sword guarding the entrance to paradise against the possible re-entry of fallen creatures, from that moment the face of God has been veiled from human eyes. Even Moses was forbidden direct perception of the face of God. But there are those sacred, singular moments in redemptive history, where God, for reasons known to Himself, was pleased to remove the veil, first to Isaiah, then to Ezekiel, and now here in the apocalypse of the Apostle John. And if we were to look at one and the same time at the content of the vision that was seen by Isaiah in chapter 6, of Ezekiel in chapter 1, and here of the Apostle John, we would see variations in detail. Yet at the same time, a profound unity of the theme as they were given the unspeakable privilege of looking into the heavenly sanctuary to see God in His glory seated upon His throne, to see God high and holy and lifted up with His train filling the temple. When we look at John's vision, after repeating the content of the letters to the seven churches, he said, after these things I looked, and behold, I saw a door standing open. It was a doorway to heaven itself. And that first voice which he has heard, which was like a trumpet speaking, said, Come up here, and I will show you those things that will shortly take place. And instantly, John was in the Spirit, he says, and behold, what he saw was this, a throne set in heaven 
and one sat on the throne. Now, almost always when we see or hear of God enveloped in glory with his refulgence in heaven, the images are of brilliance, of dazzling light, or of fire, or of smoke. But listen to what John says he saw. He who sat there was like a jasper and a sardius stone in appearance, and there was a rainbow round the throne in appearance like an emerald. He said, I saw God, and He appeared like the visage of precious stones. And he mentions three precious jewels here, the jasper, the sardius, and the emerald. Now, the jasper was a translucent, colorless gem. And some commentators say that the jasper is really a generic term for several different gems of this type, one of which is the diamond. You women who are seated here tonight who have engagement rings or wedding rings, take a second and glance at them and look at the glittering, glistening sparkle of that most precious of stones, the diamond. John said, I saw God, and He appeared as a diamond. And not only as a brilliant diamond, but also as sardius or as carnelian, which was a fire red stone. This past week, I had an experience like I've never had before in my entire life, which opened my eyes to, to something that I had taken for granted, but had never really seen how it came together. We're engaged in a building project in our church, and one of the things we're looking for in the final structure is a 13 and a half foot in diameter rose window. Which rose window is designed to symbolize the text of Isaiah 6, by the way? And we had the opportunity to go to the artist's studio who is constructing this stained glass window. And he, we had to go on Monday because he was flying Tuesday morning to Italy, and he was going to be visiting the artisans in Florence, and then from Florence he was going to be going to Germany where the special glass is blown for this particular style of stained glass window. And the purpose of our visit to his studio was to work with him to select the colors that would be featured in the window. And he had this huge rack that was situated in front of the window so that the morning light came through the window. And on this rack were various plates at colors of the ambers, the blues, the greens, and so on, of the glass that would be used for the rose window. And what got my attention was the deep ruby red pane of glass. And he then took that pane and showed us that the glass stained glass, when the red stained glass windows are the most expensive of all because the reds are made from gold, from real gold. The window is made of gold, and just a tiny, silver-thin surface 
is painted over the gold with a red patina. But the mixture of the gold and the red creates this fiery brilliance of carnelian. And I had been studying this text for this evening before I saw that window, and I said, that's the color that John saw in his vision into heaven. He saw the diamond, he saw the brilliance of the carnelia, and he saw the beautiful emerald from the rainbow. Isn't that strange? When you think of the rainbow, what do you think but the whole spectrum of the rainbow, all of the different colors that appear in the bow as we see it in the sky. But this bow that John sees does not have the light refracted or diffused, but what shines through is the emerald. Go through the pages of your scripture. Anytime we try to understand the rich imagery of the apocalypse, to flee from irresponsible flights of fancy in interpreting this book, we should seek to see how the images and the symbols that are contained in the apocalypse are used elsewhere in scripture. And so go through the scripture and see where you see the jasper and the carnelian and the emerald. One of the places, of course, are these are three of the jewels that adorn the holy city, the new Jerusalem that comes down from heaven. And also it reminds us of the institution of the priesthood in Israel where God went to great detail to design the garments and the vestments for Aaron and for the priests. And we remember at that time that the first time that the Bible ever speaks of people being filled with the Holy Ghost, those who were filled with the Holy Ghost were the artisans and the craftsmen that God had set apart in order to fashion the vessels for worship for Israel. And when God himself designed the garments of the priesthood and the breastplate of the great high priest, which the scripture said was designed, listen to this, for glory and for beauty. Three of the stones that were used in the breastplate of Aaron were the jasper, the sardius or carnelian, and the emerald, all indicating the transcendent, transparent, translucent glory of God. Isn't that interesting? I looked and I saw a throne and I saw one sitting on the throne and the one I saw looked like the crown jewels, diamonds, rubies, emeralds. And around the throne were 24 thrones and on the thrones 24 elders clothed in white robes and they had crowns of gold on their heads. If we're going to talk about these 24 elders, I wish that in preparation for this evening, I could have limited my study to 24 commentaries on the book of Revelation, but I promise you I looked at more than 24 commentaries, desperately trying to find a consensus on the identity of the 24 elders. And I have to tell you, I still don't know who these 24 elders are. Some of the best scholars argue that they are angels or angel powers that stand behind the people of God. Some look at the number 24 as representative of the 24 courses of priests from the Old Testament 
were a combination of the 12 tribes and the 12 apostles such as we find in the sides and the foundation of the holy city at the end of Revelation. But if there is a majority report, it is that the 24 elders represent the saints who have gone before us, those who have triumphed, those who have entered into glory, those who have won their crowns of gold because they have been victorious in the faith. But I have to confess, I'm not sure, but I am sure that whoever it is is part of the inner sanctum, the inner court of heaven itself round about the very throne of God. And then, of course, in addition to the 24 elders, we see the seven lamps of fire that were burning before the throne, which are the seven spirits of God. And the throne, from the throne proceeded lightnings and thunderings and voices, and that's reminiscent of Sinai when Moses went up there to receive the law, and as the people drew near to the mountain, they heard the thunder, they saw the lightning, and they heard the voices of God. But again, if you look at the imagery, it is the imagery that describes the temple or the tabernacle. The lampstands, the altar, the laver, all of these elements that were part of the tabernacle in the Old Testament and later in the temple are now part of what is seen in the inner sanctum of heaven. Then we get to verse 6 and another enigma. Before the throne, there was a sea of glass, like crystal. What is this sea of glass? Boy, watch the commentators pick each other off on this one. I mean, it's really interesting to watch the debates go on among some of the finest uh, scholars arguing over the meaning of the glassy sea. Is it the perspective different from what Ezekiel saw when he saw a crystalline sphere of the firmament above his head? But maybe now we're looking down from the throne instead of from the earth upwards, and you're seeing that, that heavenly firmament from the different direction. That's one theory. Many of the commentators say that this glassy sea represents a negative image because remember that in Hebrew poetry, the sea is always the symbol of chaos. The place that is inhabited by the Leviathan. And we are told later in the book of Revelation that in heaven there will be no sea there, indicating God's victory over all of the forces of chaos. And so they say, well, this represents sort of a connection between the fallen creation which is under the throne of God, and God rules and reigns over the fallen creation, which is symbolized by the glassy sea. But I do have an opinion about that. I don't believe that for a second. Because the sea that is used as a negative image in Hebrew poetry is never a sea of glass. It is always a sea that is roaring, that is troubled, that is in the midst of tumult. It's tempestuous. But this sea is like glass. And it calls attention to the earthly tabernacle where the entrance to the tabernacle was marked by this large bronze laver, which was part 
of the beauty of the divine holiness, a fitting platform for the throne of God. I love to think of that glassy sea, particularly how it's worked its way into the hymnody of historic Christianity. The words of holy, holy, holy. In the second verse, it goes like this, holy, holy, holy. All the saints adore thee, casting down their golden crowns around the glassy sea. What an incredible image, huh? Cherubim and seraphim falling down before thee, who wert and art and evermore shall be. What a wonderful vision taken here from the fourth chapter where later on those 24 elders who are bedecked with the white robes, wearing the golden crowns, participating in the exaltation of Christ. And when they come into the presence of God, when at last their trophies they lay down. They take the crowns, the gifts that God had given them, and they throw them down around the glassy sea, which is the only appropriate response for any Christian who comes into the presence of God and to the presence of the Lamb. Four living creatures full of eyes in front and back. The first like a lion, the second like a calf, the third like the man, the fourth living creature like a flying eagle, and all kinds of bizarre things have been interpreted from these creatures over church history. One of the most common in the early church was that they represented the four gospels. And so the gospel writers were depicted with this kind of imagery and so on. And there have been a host of suggested images from this. But the bottom line for these creatures is that they're seraphim. They are not gospel writers. These are angelic creatures. These are the angelic beings who we find in Isaiah 6 Whose, de whose duty and created function and purpose was to minister moment by moment in the presence of Almighty God. You remember how Isaiah in his vision describes the six-winged seraphim with two wings. They cover their face. With two wings they cover their feet. And with two wings they do fly. And I have always found it profoundly fascinating that when God creates things and creatures, He always creates them in such a way, fashions them in such a way as to make them suitable for their natural habitat, for their natural environment. That's why fish have fins and scales and gills, because their environment is the water. And birds have feathers and wings because their environment is the air. But the natural habitat of the seraphim is to be in the immediate presence of God. And isn't it striking that even the angels who have been created to be the attendants of God in His throne room need special appendages to cover their eyes. Because even the angels are blinded by the refulgent glory of God. Why do they cover their feet? The only thing I can think of is, biblically, the feet represent the symbol of creatureliness. 
and even exalted creatures like angels, when they're invited into the unveiled presence of God, must cover the sign of their creatureliness. And the other two wings are given to them that they can fly backwards and forth singing the song of the seraphim in antiphonal response, holy, holy, holy. The trisagion, the three times holy, the only time in sacred scripture that an attribute of God is elevated to the third degree. To the Jew, emphasis is communicated by repetition. Paul says to the Galatians, if anybody preaches any other gospel to you than that which you have heard, let him be anathema. Again I say to you, and he repeats himself. But the song of the angels is not that God is holy. or that he is holy, holy, but that he is holy, holy, holy. And like the seraphim of Isaiah 6, the living creatures of Revelation 4, do not rest day or night from saying, holy, holy, holy. All day long, holy, holy, holy. All through the night, holy, holy, holy. That's the song of the angels around the throne. Lord God Almighty, who was and is and is to come. And we read, whenever the living creatures give glory and honor and thanks to him who sits on the throne, who lives forever and ever, the 24 elders fall down before him. They worship him who lives forever and ever, and they cast their crowns before the throne. Saying, you are worthy, O Lord, to receive glory and honor and power. For you have created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We remember Romans 1 when Paul spells out the outpouring and revelation of the wrath of God against all unrighteousness and all ungodliness of men, and he explains why God brings every human being before his divine tribunal with a sentence of guilty over the world. Before Paul gives us the sweetness of the gospel, he first terrorizes us with the revelation of the wrath of God that is revealed from heaven against those who suppress the truth, who hold the truth of God in unrighteousness, and what is their sin? It is that knowing God, they do not honor Him as God, neither are they grateful. Beloved, the fundamental sinful disposition of the human heart is one towards idolatry and away from giving God the honor He deserves. Nothing is more foreign to your fallen human nature than a genuine act of worship.
And we err seriously when we assume that when we are converted to Christ that instantly that penchant for idolatry is cured. It isn't. We still have a built-in antipathy in the flesh towards honoring God as God. But the reason why we are called to worship Him is because He is worthy. Worthy to receive glory and honor and power. I wonder how many times in my life I have heard or prayed the Lord's Prayer. How many times have you heard it and prayed it? And we go over it again and again and again, and yet I still find out, I keep still discovering aspects to that prayer that I never really, really noticed or grasped before. How does it end? For thine, for thine is the kingdom. Yours is the glory. Yours is the power. Why in the world would Jesus tell his people when they pray, when they get on their knees to say to God, well, God, yours is the power. This is one of the things before whom men and angels bow in awe before the power of God who brings worlds into being through the sheer force of his command. Let there be light, there is light, that's power. And that nature reveals, as Paul says, even his eternal power and Godhead. And so true worship begins when the soul contemplates the transcendent majesty of God and said, to you belongs the power. Yours is the glory. You are the King, the Lord God, omnipotent. And so, when the crowns are thrown along the glassy sea, angelic creatures, human creatures cry out together, you are worthy to receive glory and honor and power. For you created all things, and by your will they exist and were created. We're here tonight, and in the days to come, to explore, explore together the mystery of holiness, a holiness that is in dire peril of being eclipsed from the very heart of the church today. We will never see the revival we pray for and hope for until as the people of God we recover the vision of Isaiah the vision of Ezekiel, the vision of, the, of John, when Jesus and the angels say, come on up here and let me show you the Lord God Almighty. Let's pray. Father, give us lips that are eager to sing with the angels, holy, holy, holy 
is the Lord God Almighty, that we may render to you that for which you are worthy. For we ask it in Jesus' name. Amen.